morning. Good morning. It's good to have you here on this first Sunday of the new year. Starting it out right. It's good. It's good to be with you together. Let's go ahead and join together in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to help us to understand and rightly apply His word to us this morning. Father, we uh, we need you. It seems like every day I become more keenly aware of the truth that you told your disciples, which was that apart from you we can do nothing. And so we come to you this morning, poor in spirit, acknowledging our need for your help in all areas, but especially as it comes to your word, Lord. We might get bits and pieces, we might get an intellectual understanding of it by ourselves, but without the help of your spirit, we can't rightly understand it, we can't rightly apply it, it won't transform us. And that's our desire this morning, Lord, that we would be transformed by the power of your word. I pray that we would not come to nibble on your word, but to feast on it. I pray, Father, that uh, your word would just have great power as it goes forward. Where conviction is necessary, it would happen. Where encouragement is needed, it would be received. I just pray that there would not be any spectators or consumers this morning, Lord, but each would actively receive your word by faith, the faith that you give us. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. May it not be wasted. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, Happy New Year. I just cannot believe it's 2022 already. And we say it every year, but this year especially just seemed like you blinked and it was gone. I mean, it really did. It's, Gwen and I were talking about just how crazy, like, you kind of just get used to writing 21, and then you're like, oh man, that's over. 22 now, right? 22. <laughs> but here we are, a new year already, and you know what that means. That's right, New Year's resolutions. <laughs> Have you made any New Year's resolutions? Oh, a lot of no's, wow. It's estimated that 74% of people uh, last year made some sort of New Year's resolution. And of those, about 45% were health-related. It seems like every new year, personal health is on most people's minds. And there's all sorts of things, right? I'm going to stop eating sugar. I'm going to start eating more greens, stop eating bread, start eating more fruits and veggies. I won't eat any more processed foods, so on and so forth. And yes, many people will at least attempt to make dietary changes in the coming year. And there are no shortage of options. Do you know there are literally hundreds of diets, each claiming to be the next one to meet all your health needs? So I looked, just out of curiosity, what some of the most popular diets of 2021 were. There's the Mediterranean diet. This is inspired by the foods that folks would eat who lived near the Mediterranean Sea. So fruits, veggies, nuts, beans, cereal, grains, olive oils, and of course, lots and lots of fish. Diet is low on meats and dairy, and so not for me. But for those who don't want to count calories, it's very flexible. There's no calorie limit. Or you have the DASH diet. The DASH diet is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Sounds like a blast. <laughs> High in fruits and veggies, grains, lean meat, dairy, very limited quantities of fats and sweets. You, you've got the Mayo Clinic diet. This is broken into two phases, lose it and live it. When in you're in the lose it phase, you cannot eat out at all. You cannot eat while watching television. Can't eat any sugar that's not naturally occurring, no processed food, and so on. It loosens up a little bit in the livid stage, because it's not really living in the first stage. <laughs> There's a diet for every person, all right? You want low carb? Try Atkins. You want no, no carb? Try keto. You want to go primal? Try the paleo or caveman diet. Maybe you dislike anything that wasn't once roaming around. You can try the carnivore diet. No fruits, no veggies, no grains, no legumes, no nuts, just meat, fish, eggs, and a little bit of low lactose diet. Now that's a little bit more of a diet. But maybe you want some moral support. You could try a community-based diet like Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, or the new popular Noom diet program. But maybe you like to, to be different. You're sick of going with the flow and what's popular. Maybe you want a more obscure diet. Well, I have a few for you. You could look at what's called the Fat Black Diet. Now this is based on the yak butter tea enjoyed by the people of Nepal. And so this diet says substitute a meal a day for one cup of black coffee blended with butter and oil. That's pretty gross. 
Maybe you could try the air diet from France. You cook whatever you want, whenever you want. You plate your food, you sit down to enjoy a wonderful meal, you take your fanciest silverware and your best china, spoon up a big bite of whatever sounds good. There's, there's just one small catch. When you get the food to your mouth, you don't take a bite, you just smell it instead. <laughs> the idea is that you'll trick your brain into thinking you've had a delicious meal. Yeah, this is real. The, the French. <laughs> then there's the fork diet. This is also from France. You can only eat what can be eaten and prepped using only a fork. Okay? If that's too complicated, there's the sandwich diet. You have to swap one meal with a sandwich. No sides, only what can fit on two pieces of bread. Now, I don't know about you, but I could make a lot happen with that. <laughs> But maybe you want to try the morning banana diet. This is very popular in Japan. It says you have a single banana and a glass of water for breakfast, whatever you want after noon, but you have to stop eating at least four hours before bed. Apparently you cannot buy a banana in the morning in Japan because it's so popular. Also from Japan is the vision diet. All you need to do is wear a pair of blue tinted glasses whenever you eat. Supposedly the color blue suppresses the appetite and so seeing your meal through these lenses will make it unappealing, and you will therefore eat less. There's a diet for everything and everyone, it seems. Some sound healthier than others, some sound crazier than others, but we know something for sure. In order for a diet to have a chance at working, you need to stick with it. Realistically, we all know that if we just consistently ate healthy foods, we'd be pretty healthy overall. It doesn't take a degree in nutrition to know that eating McDonald's every day is not great for your overall health. Making healthier choices and sticking to them goes a long way. But it's often easier said than done. Because think about how many of those New Year's resolutions made yesterday will be broken by this time next week? How many of them are broken right now? How many people will hear the dreaded question, how's your diet, and sheepishly mumble something about why it didn't work? How fitting that we have our text today at the time of year that we do. Because in our text today, the writer of Hebrews is also concerned with diets, but not of the physical kind. No, he is concerned with the spiritual diet of his readers. What are they feeding on when it comes to the things of God? Are they progressing as they should, or have they become stuck in bad habits? Have they grown lazy and out of shape? The writer today is, in essence, asking his readers, how's your diet? It's a good question, and one that we need to take note of ourselves. And so I invite you, even as I pray, to actively receive the word by faith as we examine how our spiritual diet affects us. And so turn your Bibles, if you would, to Hebrews 5. We're going to look at verses 11 through 14 this morning. Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 11. On this topic, we have much to say, and it is difficult to explain since you have become sluggish in hearing. For though you should in fact be teachers by this time, you need someone to teach you the beginning elements of God's utterances. You've gone back to needing milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced in the message of righteousness, because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, whose perceptions are trained by practice to discern both good and evil. It's Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. And so, so far in Hebrews, we've been introduced uh, to Jesus as the superior son of God, right? He is the, the greater prophet, the greater messenger. Remember, he's superior to angels in every way. He's the, the faithful son of God over the household, superior to Moses, who was a faithful servant in the house. But then toward the end of chapter 2, we were introduced to Jesus as our merciful and faithful high priest, a theme that was picked up again in chapter 4 and has dominated the chapter that we're currently in. The divine sonship and perfect priesthood of Christ are themes that are woven all throughout the book. And we're going to get much deeper into that priesthood in chapter 7. But now, in our text today and for the next few weeks, the Spirit does something that he's already done twice before in the letter. He's going to pull back from exposition and he turns to exhortation. In this case, he has a series of severe warnings followed up by an extended period of encouragement. Our text today is the beginning of the warning, and as noted earlier, it has everything to do with our diet. And no, not what we feed our physical bodies, although that's important, but rather what we are feeding our souls. That is of the utmost importance, and the writer of Hebrews wants to be sure that his readers have conducted a thorough evaluation 
before he moves on to the more complex parts of his teaching. And so today you're going to hear a lot about milk and solid food, a baby's diet and the diet of a mature person, a simple diet and a robust diet. And so you need to be evaluating your own diet today. Are you still drinking milk spiritually? Or have you moved on to more mature food? How is your diet this morning? The first thing I want you to see is that a poor diet prohibits deeper understanding. A poor diet prohibits deeper understanding. What we consume has a direct correlation to our cognitive function. There, there's a reason that certain foods are referred to as brain fuel or brain foods, right? Certain foods have been shown to stimulate brain activity and boost your memory. Foods like fatty fish, blueberries, nuts, dark chocolate, and so on. And yes, if you're a coffee fan, it's good. Coffee's on that list. Consuming these in appropriate quantities will help you perform at your mental best. Conversely, eating junk all the time slows you down. And yeah, you know, you have that boost of, of sugar, that rush, but is it worth it when the crash sets in and you feel like junk? The, the soda pop tasted delicious, but did you need to drink five of them in a row? Probably not, right? In a similar but far more serious way, what we consume spiritually and how we exercise our spiritual muscles directly relates to our ability to rightly understand the deeper things of God. Look again at verse 11. On this topic, we have much to say, and it is difficult to explain since you have become sluggish in hearing. Now, I want you to remember that twice in the previous 10 verses, the Spirit is quoted from Psalm 110, verse 4. He has authoritatively declared that Jesus' priesthood is of the order of Melchizedek. It's different from the Levitical priesthood. It's superior to it. And, and we might expect that after such a statement and twice quoting that, he would explain these things in more detail. And again, he eventually will when we get to chapter 7. But here, he makes a somewhat shocking charge against the readers. He essentially says, you aren't ready to hear what I have to say. He says, on, on this topic, well, what topic? The nature of Christ's priesthood as it relates to Melchizedek. He says, we have much to say. There, there's a lot wrapped up in this topic, but he makes no bones about it. It's difficult to explain. This is big boy and big girl theological discussions. There are rich, meaty truths to be discussed here, new depths to be plumbed. But he says, you aren't ready for that. It's as if he says, I'd love to get into more detail, but it would be a waste of time right now. Imagine reading this. You've been cherishing the deep truths of the sonship and priesthood of Jesus, and you're hungry for more. And then, bam! Seemingly out of nowhere, the carpet is pulled out. You hear, no, 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 slow down now. You're not ready for what I have to say next. Why? Why can't he keep going right now and expound these precious truths to them? He, he tells them bluntly. You become sluggish in hearing, dull in hearing, dull in understanding. This word used here is a unique one because it only appears in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, right here, and then once again in the next chapter, creating a sort of bookend around this idea where he talks about sluggishness again. It's used once in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in Proverbs in reference to slothful men. But outside of Scripture, this word is used quite frequently, and it gives us a bigger picture so it could refer to someone who's lazy or sluggish, mentally or physically. It's used to describe someone dim-witted or mentally negligent. It's also used to refer to a soldier who perhaps fought lazily and retreated, did not give every effort. But athletically, it referred to the participant who couldn't keep up because they were in such poor shape physically. I played a variety of sports in high school and college. And no matter what sport it was, one thing didn't change. It was always very, very clear who had been working out in the off-season and who had taken the term a little too literally. <laughs> this is a quarterback, by the way. There's a reason that coaches are so heavy on the conditioning drills early in the season. And yes, they want to get guys into shape, but at the same time, it lets them know who was doing the right things in the off-season, who maintained or even excuse me, improved their physique, and who had become sluggish. And friends, that's the idea here. Except the writer isn't concerned with waistlines. He's concerned with spiritual health. 
It's not the first time that he's addressed hearing or understanding. Remember back in chapter 2, he warned them, we must pay closer attention to the message that we have heard. Why? So we don't drift. In chapter 3, over and over and over again, we heard, oh, that today you would listen as he speaks. Listen. Don't harden your hearts against him as they did in the rebellion. Don't, don't be dull. Don't be lazy. Listen up. But now he plainly states, this has happened. They're sluggish in their hearing. They're dull and lazy. And that dullness is preventing them from receiving the deeper truths about Christ. It's important to note here, he's not saying this about every single person reading the letter. Remember, this is a diverse audience he's writing to. We have those who are authentic, committed Christians who have surrendered their lives to Christ entirely, right? We have those who intellectually assented to the gospel. They'll affirm it, but not at a heart level. There's been no real change for them. They're still kind of on the fence. And then we have those who flat out rejected Christ. And certainly we would say the last two groups, those on the fence and those who rejected, they are, they are naturally prone to dullness of hearing, to sluggishness, to laziness. But it does not mean that the first group, the authentic, committed Christians, is immune to the problem. Well, he's not saying that every single one of them is sluggish. He does want them to all be aware of the possibility of it happening. Because notice again what he says here. You have become. You have become sluggish in here. It's an important distinction. No doubt there were some in the assembly who have always been sluggish of hearing. Spiritually lazy and gave little to no effort in the things of the Lord. But the Spirit's concern here is not primarily for those people. He is concerned for those who have become sluggish in hearing. Those who were once given to careful study of the things of God, who listened attentively to his word as it was read and taught, who were at one time spiritually strong, in shape, and even improving. Now they had let themselves go. They were out of shape. They had grown dull. God's word no longer had the same punch it once did. His message didn't stir them the way it used to. Conviction was lighter. Encouragement more muted. They had become sluggish. And as a result, they were missing out on the deep things of God. He says it. Teaching you is going to be difficult. Not so much because of the subject matter, but because of their spiritual apathy. Yes, he had deep things to teach them, but their sluggishness was making it more difficult, nearly impossible to teach them at that moment in time. So we have to ask, friend, have you become sluggish in hearing? Dull in understanding? You know, the new year is a great time to take stock, to evaluate yourself. How is your time with the Lord? Do you have a time? Does God's word still excite you? Still convict you, comfort you, conform you to the image of Christ? Let me ask you this. Is it a joy or a nuisance to spend time reading God's word and praying? Is this time right now the high point of your week? Or is it an unfortunate obstacle preventing you to getting from, from getting to the real fun of the day? My friends, we need to take a hard look into the mirror of the Word of God. If you find that you have grown dull of understanding, repent. Confess your laziness, and, and we heard it last week, right? Appeal to God's mercy. Acknowledge your sin and ask Him for forgiveness. Ask Him to renew a right, a resolute spirit within you. If you do not, you're missing out on so much more than, than you know right now. God has things He wants to teach you. Things that you need to know. Things that you need to know to live the abundant life now and prepare you for eternity later. But it will be difficult if you are sluggish in hearing. And so I urge you, be committed to getting back into spiritual shape in this new year. The next thing I want you to see is that a poor diet hinders natural progress. Poor diet hinders natural progress. 
We have a natural expectation that living things will grow and develop over time. In fact, it's, it's a sign of real life, right? You, you don't expect that you'll walk into the dining room and your table has added two more spaces, right? We, we don't think that the couch is going to double in size on its own, or we don't get disappointed if we walk in the living room and our TV hasn't expanded by a few inches on its own. Most of us don't get disappointed with that. But we do expect growth from certain things. Because imagine having a garden where never, nothing ever grew beyond just a sprout, or even worse, never developed beyond a seed. Take your pets, for example. Kittens and puppies are, are cute, they're adorable, right? But we don't want them to stay that way forever. We expect them to grow, to develop, to hopefully mellow out a little bit with that development. <laughs> Perhaps the most shocking would be our children if they never progressed. Right? As a parent, it's fascinating and, and it's just a, a crazy trip to watch your kids grow and develop through those various stages. Newborns pretty much just eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom with crying in between each of those activities. But then slowly but surely, some developments are made. And it's exciting, right? The first time the baby rolls over, the first time they sit up, even more when they take their first steps. Or you can remember when they start to babble their first words. Each new development is exciting, and you can't wait to see what happens next. But imagine if your 10-year-old was toddling around, stumbling and bumbling into walls, and still had a limited vocabulary. Mama, Dada, Baba. And that was it. It wouldn't be exciting then. Be deeply concerning. You would know something was seriously wrong, and you'd be very concerned, perhaps even heartbroken. That's the same sort of concern that the writer of Hebrews has for his congregation. Rather than naturally progressing the way that they should have been, they were actually regressing. Look what he says in verse 12. Though you should, in fact, be teachers by this time, you need someone to teach you the beginning elements of God's utterances. You have gone back to needing milk, not solid food. <clears throat> what a stinging indictment from the Spirit here. The, the depths of their sluggishness is revealed. He says, this is what we expect of you by now. This is where you should have naturally grown to, but instead, you're the very opposite of what we expect. He says, you should be teachers by this time. You've been taught enough to be equipped and then teach others, both inside and outside the church. Now, now we know that there is a form of teaching that is, in fact, a spiritual gift given to certain members of the assembly. But I don't think he has this narrow view in mind here when he refers to this. I believe he's using this term in the broader sense that all Christians are called to. You know that, right? We are all teachers in one fashion or another. Whether we're teaching our kids, our friends, our family members, our neighbors, our co-workers. Whenever we interact with people, we are teaching them something. Or at least we should be. We should be teaching them what authentic relationship with God looks like in practice. We should be teaching them how what we profess to believe actually informs the way we live. We should be showing them that scripture is not just a stale static collection of the writings of dead men but rather the dynamic, living, and active words of a holy God. We are all called to that kind of teaching. And then, yes, there are those who are uniquely gifted with a more formal teaching gift in the body. It might look like mentoring or discipleship or leading a group through a portion of Scripture, mining the deeper truths of God and showing them how to apply it. But here's the sad reality. The recipients of the letter to the Hebrews were failing on all counts. You can feel the heartbreak, the disappointment, the frustration even of the writer here. You guys should be teachers by now. You've, you've been equipped, you've had plenty of time to learn, but you aren't using it. You're dull, sluggish, spiritually lazy. In fact, you think you need to be taught all over again. The expectation is you would naturally be teaching by now, but the reality is you need someone to teach you the beginning elements of God's utterances. It's the more complete translation of this would be you need someone to teach you again the beginning elements of God's utterances. You've already been taught these things. It's not as if it's anything new, but now you're acting as if you need it again. And what did they believe they needed? Beginning elements of God, uh, God's utterances, the, the first principles of the oracles of God, 
What does that mean? The elementary truths of God's word. The New English Bible did a fantastic job when they translated this phrase, the ABCs of God's word. The ABCs of God's word. That's exactly the idea here. The Spirit says, we have much to teach you, but, because, but it's difficult. Because you're so lazy. You should be teaching others, but now you think you need to go back to basics. I want to teach you calculus, but you need to learn 2 plus 2 equals 4. I want to show you Shakespeare, but you want Dr. Seuss. Ouch. I want you to notice something here. Even though this is his assessment of their current state, he never says he is going to give them what they want, what they believe they need. He will not cater to their spiritual sluggishness, to their laziness. Rather, he says, repent of it. I want to draw your attention to it. Realize it. Be made ready for the deeper things of God because they're still coming. But he doesn't shy away from their current situation. He says, you've gone back to needing milk, not solid food. You've regressed instead of progressed. You've gone backwards and it's preventing you from receiving the things you were meant to receive and from fulfilling the calling that you've been given to be teaching others. We'll address, address the milk and solid food analogy in the next verse, but for now, I want us to feel the weight of this verse for a moment. Because we cannot move on without realizing that this verse is just as much for us as it was for them. Here's the hard truth. Some of us should be teachers by now. Some of us should be fluent linguists by now, but we're still messing around with our ABCs. And so just think for a moment right now, as you look back over this year and your relationship with the Lord and your service to Him, have you made progress? Or have you retreated? Are you answering the call to serve or have you become a master of excuses? I'm too busy. Life's crazy right now. I, I am not qualified for that. I need to be taught more. I need more time before I could possibly do that. Friends, are you settling for finger painting when God is offering you a masterpiece? How is your diet? Are, are you back on milk or have you moved on to solid foods? It's such an important question because the next thing I want you to see is that a poor diet promotes spiritual ineptitude. A poor diet promotes spiritual ineptitude. There's a TV series and a couple of movies uh, that are very popular with kids under a, a certain franchise called The Boss Baby. And the premise is pretty straightforward, and it can be quite comical at times. The, the idea is that there are babies, many of them, in fact, that are not the uh, helpless, totally dependent, tiny humans we think they are. They actually all work for a company called Baby Corps, and they conduct highly sophisticated business, including top-secret spy missions. And so they wear fancy suits, drive cars, have cell phones, and secretly conduct all this business when we're not looking, right? It's a silly idea, and it's good for a laugh because of its sheer ridiculousness. Because we know in reality there's not much that a baby can do besides the aforementioned eating, sleeping, crying, and messing their diapers. That's not much of a resume, right? Let's say you need someone to cut your grass, do some electrical work, or drive you to the airport. Are you going to call the newborn down the street? The, the idea of it is just madness. They have no ability to do those things. They're, they're totally limited by the stage of life and development they're in. And so we would never expect them to be able to do those things. But how shocking if you called the teenager down the road to cut your grass, or an electrician to install the panel, or you scheduled an Uber to take you to the airport only to be told, can't help you, sorry Timmy's sleeping all day, Bob can't install the panel, he's teething right now and he's very irritable, Susie can't drive, she needs to be changed again. It's one thing to be a legitimate infant, naturally limited by your stage of life, and entirely another to be perfectly capable and regress into infant-like attitudes and actions. How sad that this seems to happen so often in churches all over the world today. It was no different for our Hebrew audience. We've gone back to needing milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced in the message of righteousness. 
because he is an infant. Milk is great for growth. Especially a mother's milk. It's jam-packed with nutrients and it helps babies grow and develop both physically and neurologically. So important, in fact, is milk or a formula substitute that it's exclusively what a baby consumes for at least the first three months of their lives. And often much longer. Usually it's like the four to six month period you start to introduce so-called solid foods, which but baby food is anything but solid. But it's different, right? And you still sporadically do that. But the, the main diet is still milk or a formula substitute. It's good. It's even necessary for a time. But what would you think if a 10-year-old seven-year-old, even five-year-old, was still drawing all their nutrition from simply milk. It would not only be weird, it would be detrimental to their development. It, it would hinder their abilities. But that's the charge laid before the readers of this letter. You've gone back to needing milk. Notice it's, it's not as if that's what they needed all along. They've returned to it. They've regressed to it. Instead of steak and potatoes, they're satisfied with milk, and the results are damning. They are inexperienced in the message of righteousness. They're unskilled and inept with the teaching about righteousness. What does that mean? They don't know how to rightly receive, interpret, and apply God's word. Most especially the gospel. Stated another way, they're malnourished in the things of God. They might know some of the ABCs. Jesus died on the cross, rose again, but it has no real impact on the way they live. Maybe they can recite John 3.16, but they have no idea how God so loving the world that he gave his one and only son affects them right here, right now, today. They can't draw right connections because they're babies, spiritually immature and incapable of getting the most out of what has been presented to them. You wouldn't put a steak before a baby, would you? They would have no idea what to do with it. Sure, they'd pick it up and put it in their mouth because babies put everything in their mouth. But that's not the point. They wouldn't savor it. They wouldn't draw all the nutrients from it because they can't. They aren't equipped to. And so it is with the spiritual babies. Don't get me wrong here. Every believer, just like every human, goes through a period of infancy. No one expects someone who just received the gospel to be immediately mature in the things of God. Friends, if we're honest, how many times have we seen new believers put seasoned believers to shame in their maturity? How often do new believers have a greater spirit of joy and gratitude? How often do they delight in sharing their faith, expressing unwavering trust in the God that has reconciled them, passionately pursuing Him in, in reading His Word and in prayer? Many times it's the so-called baby Christians that put the rest of us to shame. Nevertheless, there is a period of time where milk is needed for those who are growing in Christ. Peter told his audience, crave the spiritual milk of the word, just like newborn babies. But that cannot be our end game, my friends. That cannot be our final destination. We must not be content staying in infancy, or worse, reverting back to it after a time of growth and development. Returning to milk once we have tasted the solid food of God's word is a sign that we have become dull, sluggish, spiritually lazy. It prevents us from receiving the deeper things of God and then sharing them with others. Some of us in this room have stalled in infancy. Others have grown out of it only to return to it. If that's you, I, I urge you this morning to, to grow up, so to speak. Adjust your spiritual diet and move beyond simple milk. Move beyond the ABCs of God's word and grow. The final thing I want you to see this morning is that a proper diet is proof of maturity. A proper diet is proof of maturity. The Spirit has given us warnings about a poor diet, about sluggishness and laziness, about regressing in, into infancy, and general immaturity that comes with that. But now he puts forth a new portrait, one he wants his readers to aspire to. This, this is the one who eats well, who is weaned off of the milk, and enjoys solid food. He wants his readers to reach maturity. 
And so it ought to be for us. Look at verse 14. But solid food is for the mature, whose perceptions are trained by practice to discern both good and evil. Milk is for infants, it's for babies. Solid food is for the mature, for those who have grown up. Milk is for the sluggish and the lazy, but solid food is for those who are in shape, for those who can handle it and know what to do with it. W would you take a baby to eat at a Michelin-starred restaurant? They, they wouldn't get anything out of it. It would be wasted on them. They, they wouldn't be able to digest most of it, and certainly they wouldn't appreciate it. But that adult foodie friend in your life, right, the one who knows all the best places to find the very best dish possible, well, they would look at that restaurant experience completely differently. To them, it would be a night to remember. They would savor every bite, appreciate each flavor profile, the balance of the dish, the layers of flavor, the skill of the chef in preparing and presenting the meal. Friends, that is the difference for the infant and the mature when it comes to the food of God's Word. Spiritual babies are content with the basics, with the bedtime Bible stories. Spiritually mature crave more. They want the meat of God's word, the deep things of the word, the things that make us think and wrestle, and yes, those things that make us uncomfortable. Too many people today think that good Bible teaching is simply teaching that makes you feel good. Understand that. Too many people today think that good Bible teaching is simply teaching that makes you feel good. Good about yourself, good about life, good about your circumstances. It's just not so. Yes, there are times when God's Word does that, but it's so much more than that. Friends, God's Word is there to encourage you, yes, but also to convict you, to challenge you, to renew your mind and conform you to the image of Christ. And that is often not a comfortable process. It's often a slow, painful, even agonizing one, but worth it. And in fact, necessary. And the mature see the value of that and welcome it. In the immediate context of this letter, the solid food is the upcoming teachings about the priesthood of Christ. Teaching that the Spirit says it would be wasted on spiritual infants who would rather have milk. But if they really want to know their Savior better, to see Him and savor Him as He is meant to be, they need to move on to solid food. Friends, there is plenty of milk being spilled in pulpits all across the country today. And the swelling sizes of those congregations reflect the reality that we have a lot of suckling Christians out there. Or worse yet, those who have deceived themselves into believing they are Christians at all, when in reality they are looking for the newest self-help, self-esteem boost, or quick path to happiness, success, and prosperity. We don't need more suckling Christians. More lazy and sluggish Christians. More regressing Christians. Friends, we need Christians who are mature. Who consistently turn down the milk in favor of the solid food. Hear me now, even when it's harder to swallow. Look at the results of the right diet. Solid food is for the mature, and by virtue of that maturity, they're able to receive that solid food and its sanctifying effect. Rather than being sluggish and lazy, the mature are trained to discern both good and evil. That, that word trained, it's the same word as disciplined or exercised. Outside of the Bible, it was used of young men who would train naked with great vigor to compete in the games. You say, well, why would they train naked? Because they wanted to train in such a way that nothing would hinder them. Nothing would slow them down, not even their clothing. That's the attitude of the mature. Rather than dullness, discipline. Rather than sluggishness, striving. Rather than laziness, labor. And yes, rather than milk, meat. And it brings great benefit. They discern good from evil. The mature don't agonize over what's right and wrong. They're able to discern it. And it's not just making a moral judgment in the moment. It's not just that they intellectually know right and wrong, good from evil. Rather, they make a practice of doing these things. It's one thing to know what's right. It's entirely another to faithfully do what is right. The mature will demonstrate this in their lives. 
Does that describe you this morning, my friend? What does your life and practice say about your maturity? Let me ask it in the way I've already asked. How is your diet today? As you look back over this last year and onto the new year, what, what needs to change? Where do you need to grow? Where have you gotten out of shape? Ask those hard questions and then appeal to God's mercy. Pray for grace and strength in continuing to transform you today. So what are our next steps? For some of us, we need to get into shape. There's no off-season in the Christian life. But sadly, some of us treat it that way. And so you have to ask, am I growing dull and sluggish? If so, repent and return to the exercise and discipline of the mature. Some of us need to grow up. Are you progressing or are you regressing? Are you ready to fulfill the calling that God has given you or are you comfortable living as an infant? And yes, some of us need to change our diet. There's too much milk out there. Way too much. Be committed to feasting on solid food. And it starts with you in your home every day if you are able, making time to meet with the Holy God and savoring that experience from start to finish. Not, not just a bite here and there, but truly a feast and then digest it, apply it to your life and situation in practical ways. I just want to end by saying that if you're here and you don't know Christ as Savior, you need to hear me because you're not even a baby this morning. You're dead. You're spiritually dead. Stuck in your sin and separated from a holy God. But here's the, the, the joyful blessing. You don't need to stay there. God has provided a way out. A, a way to be made right with him. A way to come alive. In sending his perfect, sinless, spotless son to live the life that you could not live and die the death that you deserve, he says, I invite you to receive that life, death, and victorious resurrection to be credited to your account. To be credited to your behalf. And so if you're here and you don't know Christ, I urge you, I invite you to receive him by faith. To, to come to life here today on January 2nd, 2022 to be born for the first time in your life and start that process of maturity. And if you want to know what that looks like, I beg you, please come see me after the service. But do not delay. Don't let this be a New Year's resolution that falls to the wayside. Today is the day of salvation and you don't know when tomorrow is too late. Let's pray.